What is up? Week 14, we here, we back, we still grind away. There's stars falling down left and right. You know, MVP candidates falling to the ground, but we're still, we're still striving. You know, we're still, we're still here. Uh, and March Madness, a lot of shots going on, um, going on right now. So make sure you guys tune into that. We are going to be covering two divisions, as we always do. And this, it's time for the Southwest. And when we're talking about bad teams, we're going to talk about a team that potentially could be challenging, trust the process for the worst record of all time. And that is H-Town, Houston Rockets. Salt break, 0-4 this week, 11-30 and 30 overall. Ooh, oh boy. Talk to me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the Rockets. Um, I guess... I'm kind of I'm known for being salty. I'm not actually that salty because this has been happening so long. We just accept it as a fact at this point. Um, their last win was on the second of February. We're coming up on two months without a win, um, which is heavy. Uh, obviously, lost twenty straight, um, and they are the only franchise to have a twenty-game win streak and a twenty-game losing streak. So they are nice. unique. Right there. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's not been great. The main reason, obviously, that they're so bad is that John Wall, Victor Oladipo, and Christian Wood have only played five games. Um, this losing streak has basically spanned the entire time that Christian Wood's been out. Um, those things are obviously related. They were on, you know, a good little win streak. They were they were 11 and 10 when Christian Wood went out. And uh, it's, all, it's all gone downhill since then. Yeah, sort of that, that picture that Foley posted, uh, Christian Wood returning back to the locker room thinking, what has gone on here? Like All you right. said. Yeah. Paul is uh, in Endgame, walking around with no, hey kid, what happened here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all doom and gloom, but I'm going to give you a different take. It's not doom and gloom. Because to... to to reiterate the situation that the Rockets are in, in that Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook trade, they gave the Thunder the rights to swap picks in the upcoming draft. Yeah. So whoever's pick is better gets the swap unless it's in the top four, top four protected. So the Thunder will, uh, the Thunder will get the Rockets pick if it's number five, number six, number seven, number eight. So the Rockets need to be bad. Otherwise, they will get a basically middle of the first round pick and any any tanking, any kind of, you know, being bad, it will just, it'll just be for nothing. It'll be for absolutely nothing. They need to be terrible. And a lot of these losses, big losses against really bad teams. So they've lost to the Pistons, the Thunder, the Kings, yeah. the Cavs. They have been taken out against all these teams who they need to sit above in the lottery. Now, granted, the odds are relatively flat. So if they have the worst, I think it's like three, um, they're a bottom three team, they have a 52.1% chance of keeping their pick. So even if they're one of the three worst teams in the league, um, they only have a 50-50 chance, basically. But obviously, your, your odds are already bad. Don't make them worse. So make sure you're a bottom three team. They are one and a half games um, ahead of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Expect them to fall behind. Expect them to have the worst, worst uh, record in the league and hopefully to get that number one pick. Fading for Cade. Let's talk about that Thunder game that was last night where I was thinking, oh, they might be able to break it. But John Wall gets stopped by Lou Dort. Wally, are you ready for this nickname? Put him in the Dorcher oh. Chamber. Love that. <laughs> Love that. Great block. Um, came from behind, swatted it against the backboard. Thunder miss. Uh, they only hit one or two free throws. So, so Rockets come out of the timeout. You know, the, the game is they're only down two. There's about two or three seconds left. Christian Wood walks out. He's just shaking his head. You know why? Because they designed John Wall, who was one of six from three, to take a pull-up three. They are actively tanking. That is a bad decision. Bray, we're going to close it on this. Uh, as you know, Philly, uh, 28 games losing. I 
did witness that. That was awful. Uh, so they're eight games out. Do you think they're going to break the rules time record? Yeah, because let's let's bear it so that we've got the trade deadline coming up. Depot should be moved um, unless they can't find a deal for him um, or, they, or they are a bit stubborn. Um, I think they will move him. So their team is going to get worse. Obviously, Christian Wood is incredibly disenfranchised, so he's not going to be doing much. Um, I can't, I think he got he got a mid sized contract, so he's not he's not a contract year for, for him. So he's not got no incentive to ball out. He's probably just going to chill for, for the rest of the season, I would imagine. Um, and they just haven't got any talent, have they? I don't think the Rockets will break it. They've got two games against the Timberwolves coming up. I think they win one of those. Right, let's move to our second team in Mardi Gras. I watched the Simpsons early, a Simpsons episode earlier this week with Chief Wig and P.I. Uh, the spin-off series was taking place in New Orleans and I was like, why isn't this a full-time show? Uh, go check that out. But yeah, let's head down to New Orleans with uh, Mr. Blackout himself. Uh, you know, stay holding in there, uh, George. We can't see you right now, but we we with you in spirit, brother. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Stay strong. And I, I know you're missing my face, but I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> um, yeah, so New Orleans. Um, it's been a mix this week. Um, not going to lie. Uh, so they've gone two and two. Uh, two wins, two losses. Um, so in that um, middle range. And in the last 10, they've gone four and six. So they have dropped a couple of games. Here's where it gets a bit um, confusing or weird or unusual, shall we say, in those few words. Um, the thing is, with uh, the Pelicans right now, they have been putting on shows and performances, which are quite surprising in the fact that they're beating teams, which you don't expect them to beat. And then when it comes to um, other teams where you think, oh, yeah, that, that's going to be great game, standard win, let's go. They seem to struggle a lot more and then drop the ball and make mistakes. Um, these past uh, couple of losses um, did come twice to Portland uh, uh, this week. Um, in the first one, I think... Dame heard what me and Bray were saying last time we were talking about who's right for MVP league and then he just went off for 50 points. I mean, when I saw that, I was I was so happy and then I remembered that I've got the Pelicans so I was I was kind of upset as well at the same time, but yeah. Lillard went off and that that happened in like the last 7 minutes of the game. They Lillard was just going off again and again, uh, three-pointers. And this continued on into the next game as well, early on. Just kept on pulling up from three, pulling up from logos. And, yeah. And, anyway, this shouldn't be talking about the Trailblazers. Sorry. I'm, yeah, do I'm it, do going it. off on <laughs> tangent. Wrong week, wrong week. <laughs> 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 we'll get back to that. But, yeah, I think at the moment, it seems to be um, with both of my teams, which I'm discussing this week, um, that issues are coming from like turnovers and small mistakes in the late game. So, yeah, which I'll touch on more later on as well. Big win against the Nuggets. Uh, I think it was last night. Zion balling out 30 points, shot 9 to 13. I mean, if you're if you're the Pelicans, give him the ball every possession down because the guy shoot sixty percent from the field. You can't really go against that. That's and yeah. I spoke to Ultra. He's on pace to beat Shaq's record of twenty points per game with shooting a certain percentage, which is nuts. Wow. We're not going to talk about Zion, though. No. We're going to talk about Lonzo Ball. So the trade talk started to heat up two days ago. Apparently, the Clippers were interested. You know, maybe Lavar's trying to bring him back to Los Angeles. Uh, and now Kevin O'Connor is reporting that the Bulls, Bray, remember that's your team, and the Hawks are interested. <laughs> what? Uh, should the Pelicans get rid of Lonzo, George? Um, in my opinion, like in an ideal world, like I really want to keep him. So the main issue 
when it comes to making this decision right now is which plays a massive factor is definitely that um Bledsoe contract that is a massive contract um which no one seems to want to pick up <laughs> so it puts them in in between a rock and a hard place where they need to make a decision to make a push like it's obviously there and there are big talks around it um I think like with me and like I'm hoping other Pelicans fans are with me on this they ideally would want to keep them but it's just yeah it's tough to see where it's going to go from there seeing as they're kind of trapped in that situation um out of all the trades talks which are going down, I had loads. I've heard, like you mentioned, Hawks, Bulls, Clippers, Hornets at one point. I, I can, yeah, I was angry about that Hornets. I do not want to see that happening. I'm happy with the Bull Bull brothers remaining separate. I know I see I I know. Ed's hands out. But, um, I mean, I sort of want to see it. I was, I, it's too I, soon, I, I, man. On, yeah. On my back. Like, like on Alex my said, I agree with that. I think it's too soon. Like, um, you kind of It'll saw like it with Jello and um, Mello when they were playing on the same team for a while. Um, it wasn't quite there. I mean, I know that's a while back, but I would like to see them build themselves up first, then them bring it together. Let them see how they build their game on their own and then bring it back together personally. For me personally, I think they need to move Matt Brandon and Brandon Ingram. I think really? he needs to go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brandon Ingram needs to go because I don't think he's a good fit with uh, Zion. And I think Lonzo and Zion fit really well together. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's me personally. Like he mentioned with uh like you mentioned with Zion, he's going off with um with that 30 point game Ingram's having that as well and I think they're proving to be a very dangerous duo in the NBA like going off I think they're like top three I saw in a start at one point I need to double check those facts but yeah they're 18 and 24 George Mm -hmm. how dangerous are they going bro Every time Brandon Ingram takes a shot, I go, oh, I kind of wish Zion took a shot on that possession. Every single one. 100%. Yeah. Mm. Kids, kids are monster. Let him loose, bro. Let Quick, him so loose. Is Ingram, he's an out-and-out small forward, right? He's not going to be a stretch power forward. He's just going to be an out-and-out small forward. I don't think he can bang with the with the fours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but but yeah, I think he's a fan of four. Like, if Jimmy Butler's fan of four, like, yeah, you're all right with that. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. It's, no, it's, it's Jimmy weird. Butler would muscle him, man. Yeah, but he's he's long enough that he's still going to contest all the shots, regardless of whether. Yeah, like Jimmy Butler's going to get a bet, get get a good position. I agree with that, but he's he's got the length. I think oh, well. KD is the only person that's been able to pull that off with that sort of girth, and he's not. He's just not. I don't think he's long enough to be that impactful. Yeah, but then, he, 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 Jimmy Butler does also play with three as well, so that's probably just a poor example on my part. He's taking it back. We'll we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see because the deadline is on Thursday. We'll be discussing a lot more trades later on in the show. Lancashire Lambeer, how are we doing, my man? Sitting back quietly, you know, accept, accepting the notes, waiting for your time. Your time is now. The time is Memphis. Two and two this week. 19 and 20 overall. How you doing, my man? Had a good week? Yeah, the um, the winds have finally come back in the Lancashire Lambier household. Um, Grizzlies, two and two. I think every time you've come to me this season, they've been two and two. I don't know how. And that does play into the fact that they are 19 and 20 overall. They are always even. Um, so they're sitting in 10th, which, to be honest, I think is probably where they'll finish. They've been consistently playing like that, like that throughout the whole year. But of late, um, they've been doing good. They've really improved their last four games. For example, the two defeats were against the Suns and the uh, against the Suns and the Warriors, and their two victories were against the Heat and the Warriors. So um, the win against the Heat actually a really good result, um, considering that the Heat had won five on the bounce before that, and the Heat decided to play in their 
Pacers uniforms, and they've certainly played oh, like the Pacers. Disgusting. Um, so that, that did help with the victory there. Um, and that was a Bra- sorry, race. Bray's got no argument for that because he knows how ranked they are. <laughs> Even <laughs> as much of a homer, he knows how bad those uniforms are. They're disgusting. Anyway, yeah, sorry. They're honestly, about... moving yeah, they're because... honestly horrific, and they, they played like the Pacers. It was a very low scoring game. The Grizzlies <laughs> ended up winning 89 to 85. Of that. I think both teams shot about 23% from three point and 35% from the field, like very poor. But um, in terms of what decided that game, Jar Morant, with about five seconds to go, um, ran the whole length of the court to lay it up with about one and a half seconds left on the clock. So nice little play there for the win from Jar. And then they had back-to-back games against the Warriors. First one, um, Andrew Wiggins scored 40 points. Like, absolutely ridiculous. Um, he really steps up without uh, Steph Curry. And then they beat the Warriors 111-103, to 103, in which was probably the more normal result, what you'd expect, considering they out-rebounded the Warriors 60-46, to 46, which is a given, considering there's no Wiseman or Pashar or Looney for the Warriors. So um, definitely an expected result there. Yeah, JV, Valentinus coming up huge in that. 19 points, 15 rebounds. He has been padding the stats on the boards. But in that game... Uh, Morant nearly baptised Draymond Green, okay? Mm. And I think it, it, it happened twice in both in back-to-back games, similar to the attempt he had on Kevin Love where he nearly ended his whole career. So the question I have for you, Lancashire Lambert, is if there was a player you would most likely to dunk on, who would it be? Give me the scenario, you know, what's the, what's the score? Is it a tie game? Is it, you know, give me, give me a scenario. Give me the whole, the whole scope. I think who 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 I'd personally most like to yes, dunk on yes. is in me. Who, yeah, you're okay. dunking. Say likely, it, likely or would you like to? Like to. Not oh, like to. Okay. Likely, okay. No, yeah, yeah. like to dunk oh. on. They're right there. I'd love to dunk on Yanis. My God, that would be an achievement. Imagine having that on my CV. <laughs> Dunked on Yanis. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's huge. <laughs> he's about a foot taller than me and I'm six foot four. What are you doing? Are you coming into the lane? Are you are you cradling it back? What are you doing? What's the play? Nah, it's it's obviously the very last seconds of game seven of the finals, isn't it? Like that, that's a given. <laughs> um, and I'm coming in kind of like, do you know LeBron against Draymond Green in game seven when he very nearly did that? I'm yeah. absolutely oh. yamming it down. But unlike LeBron, I'm actually finishing it. And Yanis just falls to the floor. I got dunked by some wow, guy from like Lancashire. It. Yeah, the Russian, the Russian Yanis is back. The Russian Yanis, <laughs> yeah. That's how that's how that's how brutal the dunk is. It knocks him out and it means he turns Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. Unlike LeBron, you heard it here first. Yeah. Lancashire Lambert, better dunker than LeBron. I like Lancashire it. LeBron. Oh, <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> Oh, well, that's a, that's a good one to end on. Okay, let's move to the Dallas Mavericks with one bar Wildy. Uh, two and two this week again, 22 and 19 overall. The Mavs, considering the start that they have, they had uh, a playing really good basketball, Wildy. Talk to me. Absolutely, man. Um, it's been awesome. Uh, very dire straights at the beginning. Um, uh, I predicted with their record last time that they'd reached out 500. They did it and they've continued to climb, as you say. Um, uh, four games this week. They had two mini series, once against the Clippers and the Blazers. Um, so, Clippers series, game one, uh, that Clippers had you know, everything to play for. Last time these guys faced off together early on in the season, um, Clippers handed them a loss that was the fourth worst loss on the road um, in NBA history. They were up by 50 at one point. Uh, so Clippers really had something to prove. Um, look, I mean, uh, Luca ends up getting a triple double. Um, unfortunately, they end up losing it. Um, it was actually it would have been a lot worse, uh, but Luca and Tim Hardaway Jr. were just hitting crazy shots down the stretch to try and keep it close. But um, unfortunately, couldn't couldn't bring it back. They just ran out of time on that one. Um, 
look, they lost the rebounding battle um, in that game. And it's tough, really, because they don't really have any natural sort of you know, big rebound number guys. And um, when you're losing the rebounding battle and they turn over the ball as much as they did, which was 14, by the way. Um, and they're one of the better teams that are looking after the ball, but turning it over 14 times against the Clippers just isn't going to get it done. Um, you know, they're, they're going to, you're going to lose, unfortunately. Um, so Trevor Double didn't get it quite done because I think um, if everyone else isn't pulling their weight, on the little things like taking care of the ball and getting the rebounds, then you're just not create. You're not going to have enough opportunities um, to score enough uh, effectively. It doesn't matter how spectacular uh, someone like Luca can be, um, or at least you might think that until the next game. <laughs> so game two against the Clippers, and you've got somebody like Luka Doncic. Uh, if you beat him once and you play in the very next game, it's very unlikely you're going to beat him again because of his knowledge of the game and what he is able to do. So they win the rebounding battle in game two, um, 43 to 37 against Clips, which obviously is an age uh, difference. However, you know, as long as they keep it close, they're going to give themselves a good chance to win. Uh, Luca doesn't get the triple double, but he gets 42 um, and scores any way he wants. Um, just to sum up the game, there's a particular play where Luca is being base guarded with the ball at the halfway line, beats his man and then gets three clippers to rotate over to him, leaving Maxi Cleaver of all people open for a lob. So just the, the havoc that this guy causes when he makes his first move is just incredible um, and allows his teammates to drive so much better um, when he's playing. So yeah, yeah that, that's one for one. Um, very similar uh, story uh, in terms of the Blazers series. Had two games lost the first one and won the second one. Now, in the League of Superstars, you live and die by your stars. Living by Luca is a very good way to live. Um, that first Blazers game was really close up until fourth. Mavs have a bit of check of history about giving up fourth quarter leads, which they had. Um, but fortunately, CJ McCollum, just coming back off injury, uh, decided to go crazy. Him and Dane had 30 points apiece, which is just going to be crazy to overcome basically so unfortunately it didn't quite work out there but once again a few days off next game Luca comes back and he goes he hits eight he goes eight for eight from three takes a ninth one and misses it because when you're that hot why aren't you going to shoot the ninth one you know shoot to you miss kind of mentality uh but unbelievable um performance by Luca there and um, yeah, uh, again, if they win the rebound in total, it's 55 to 33 in that second game against the Blazers. If they if they if they focus on the rebounding, then they're going to win because if you got Luca and you have more opportunities and the other team to score more time more times often than not, you're going to win the game. Yeah, Luca yeah, yeah. final game against the Blazers was really clicking. He the Mavs go on a 19-0 run and he hits about three step back threes in a row and I'm thinking wow this is unguardable uh, like you said yeah. Wally he went eight for nine from three um we spoke a lot about Luca, but there's a guy that potentially was on my team um and I've actually sort of trashed but he's he's come back into the fray a bit and he's he's playing really well Josh Richardson he's averaging 14.6 points per game on 49 percent from the field 37 percent from three and 93 percent from the line the maps mm -hmm. have won their the 13 of their last 18 games. What have you seen from uh, Josh Richardson? Yeah, I've just seen him become a lot more comfortable. Uh, look, it was a weird year last year for him. Um, I you know, have to call myself out a little bit on this. I, I agree. I wasn't totally happy with his output, um, especially since he's taken the Seth Curry spot when he was you know, really important to them. Um, but, you know, in this week alone, you look at when he scores efficiently uh, and scores high, the you know, they win um, in the in the Clippers win. Uh, yeah, he got 14 points. Um, I think he went five for nine. Um, so that's nice and efficient. And then also in um, game against Blazers, he got 21 and went eight for 11. So that's the kind of performance that you want from a role player uh, around a superstar. Um, you know, if you're ever going to pick a time for a guy to start finding his way in his role within the team, it's now. Um, there's a lot to be said for not peaking too early. Um, as we're leading our way up towards the playoffs, uh, if he's finding his stride, 
than than great. I even think he's changed his shot a little bit. If anything, it looks a little bit all, more awkward than it did before, but it's going in more now than ever. So, hey, man, just keep doing what you're doing and, uh, yeah, do your thing. Just with uh, Jalen Brunson, um, I, I didn't bring him up last time we spoke about him because uh, I wanted to see if this was going to sustain. Um, but he's averaging 12 points um, for the Mavs, which is the same num- same amount of points that Seth is averaging for Clip uh, for Philadelphia. Excuse me. Um, and the reason I bring that up is is that he is 52.9% uh, on field goal, which is leading the Mavs. So that that efficiency that they lost with Seth is being being made up by uh, Jalen Brunson of all people. So, uh, you know, it's just quite nice that they have that word there. So I just wanted to give that a shout out to him. Nice. One word answer from you here. Are the Mavs a contender? Yes. Right. Let's talk about a team which is going to probably be very active. They have said there's been interest there. Uh, and a team that is continues to overperform, and they went three and one this week. They're twenty two and seventeen overall, and that is go Spurs go. How's Lasku? How is it in Camp Spurs? And I had to correct you for a while, Alex, but I think let me just start here. So last week, when I was just listening over to the episode, you say re- you reward winning when the team in number one. You speak about fifth. Secondly, you said overperforming. How dare you overperforming? What are you on about? So. There you'll start starting two corrections. Anything to say for yourself, Mr. Ward? No, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> you know <laughs> nothing's going to change. Over- overperforming. No, I'll back Alex on that one. They're definitely- yeah, I agree. Yeah. Haters, haters. Just because you let the Spurs fall to me. And can I say something about this division? Coming into it, I felt it was going to be super, apart from the Rockets, because... Unlike, I think Bray was the only one who didn't know that James Harden was going to be traded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James Harden did sell it. Yeah, we're, we're on my part. I didn't, I didn't foresee it ending no, 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 no. quite as badly as it did. Um, but... Bray's at the dinner party like, oh man, I'm so excited about this year. You'll be playing Rockets. It's going to be really good. We're going to win some games. And James is like, am I going to be there? <laughs> I mean, oh, I yeah, like my... half a season. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, like feel it, like man. get like ten games of eating. That's what he did off the court. Eat, just chill. But anyway, <laughs> we digress. The reason I bring it up is because I do. I felt this division was going to be one of the most. I had no idea what to make of most of the teams. I liked all the teams going into it. No, I had no problem having the Pelicans. I had no problem having the Grizzlies. I just felt there were so many quality teams that all similar teams in this division and the fact that Spurs fell to me I felt was super undervalued now the reason I say all this is looking at the Spurs record recently so last time we spoke they were 17 and 12 they are now 22 and 15 so 10 games stretch they went five and five last week they were three and one now in that five and five stretch their losses came against the Nets in overtime the Sixers and the Bucks you know top of the East teams fair their biggest win came against the Knicks. So one thing that the Spurs have been able to do is that they have been able to beat the teams they are supposed to beat. But when it comes to those bit more elite teams, they have struggled a bit more. That's why I say I don't think they're overperforming because they are they are doing their job. And considering that they don't have the most star power, DeMar DeRozan is obviously their star player and they've got a lot of young pieces we're going to talk about a little bit later. So that's why I thought that was a little bit harsh. But again, I can understand that. Um, they are, I think, 10 and 10 this year at home, which is a bit surprising for the Spurs. But hopefully that's another thing where you're like, they could be performing better at home. They could have a home record. Now, um, one of the reasons why I think they, they are potentially struggling against the better teams is they don't necessarily have explosive scoring. They are, I, think, I believe, fourth from bottom in three-point attempts they attempt roughly 30 a game when you compare that to utah who shoot 43 a game that's an extra 13 threes a game it's a massive gap um and there's a bunch of points you miss out on just because of that but again they know they don't have the best three-point shooters uh devin vassell their rookie this year is shooting 41 percent at multiple threes a game which is great that's the sort of draft pick you want to hit on and that's my next point i was just wondering all of the Spurs recent like lottery picks or picks that they had in the first round. And I was just super impressed by the way they were able to drop. So a couple names since actually 2010, or actually in the last 10 years. And this isn't included Kawhi Leonard, who they traded for in the George Hill trade with Indiana. So some of their players, they drafted Corey Joseph in the first round. Everyone loved him, got a ring with San Antonio, went to Toronto. Nice for him, solid player. 
now stuck in San Diego. He's on a nice contract. Uh, 2014, they drafted Slow Mo. Who doesn't love Kyle Anderson? Um, and then 2015, some geezer called Nikola M- Miller, Mil- Miller. Yeah, some guy called Nikola. He's he's still playing in Europe, so that's fine. That doesn't count. Uh, 2016, Dejounte Murray. 2017, Derek White. 2018, Lonnie Walker. 2019, Keldon Johnson, and then Devin Vassell in 2020. That is super impressive, and this is coming from a guy who supports a, a team that drafted Mario Hazonia fifth and Mo sixth. So I know how hard it is to pick players. I, I've seen my franchise do a very bad job of it. Um, and again, the reason I brought it up is just how well the Spurs have been drafting these players and. With a deep draft this year, I'm really intrigued to see who they'll draft again. Yeah, massive credit to RC Buford and Greg Pop. They do a yes. great job with recruitment and really molding these players. Great transition for us because we are going to talk about two of their young players coming up, which brings me to my stat line of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, mm. Lord. Keldon Johnson. Against the Cavaliers, 23 points, 21 rebounds, two assists, one steal, two blocks in 39 minutes. This guy plays small forward, ladies and gentlemen. So 2020, first player to do it since Tim Duncan did it for the Spurs. Can't remember which year. Anyway, KJ gets a 2020 game. Lonnie Walker has a career high in the Bucks, uh, 31. Which player, Ed, would you like the Spurs to build around if you had to pick between those two is there somebody that I'm missing or are they just, they're good together? Are they just good together? Um, so just to rub a little bit, uh, salt brain into the wounds for Alex. Uh, me and Alex were, it was me versus Alex this week in fantasy and I have got uh, Kelvin Johnson. So Alex had to suffer that 2020 game. And this is the guy who's second from bottom or third from bottom in fantasy. And, to, and for me to beat Alex this week was a, a big win for me. And thank you, KJ, for that. So anyway, as Alex said, KJ, um, he is a small forward, which is um, because he plays a lot bigger than what he is. He's 6'6", and he's just relentless at attacking the rim and getting these rebounds. Alex, 20 rebounds, 11 of those were offensive rebounds and quite a few of them, there were two defenders on him and he still just managed to get it. And it's just, he's got this engine about him. It's so fun to watch and he's just so direct and that's a skill that he has got already that is so useful. Um, then with every other NBA player, it always becomes the question about three-point shooting it is how good is his three-point shot, especially if we're playing small forward and you need to have a respectable shot it's gone down his three-point shooting has gone down a little bit from last year um he was injured for a lot of last year this year he's getting a, an extended period of time being healthy um he's currently shooting just above 30 percent, which isn't ideally where you want to be but hopefully that's something that can develop and we want to spurs have got a shot doctor there who helps with their three-point shooting uh, which is how Kawhi Leonard became so good with his shot uh, Lonnie Walker, he got a 30 point game. It was his first ever 30 point game. The reason, if I had to pick between KJ and Lonnie, I would say uh, KJ because in January was the last time Lonnie Walker had a 20 point game. He isn't necessarily as polished as KJ is as of yet, but I'm not going to choose between them because I do like the core that the Spurs do have with um, Jante Murray at the point guard, really good on the def- defensive end as well. Pair him up with, um, the, uh, with Lonnie Walker. KJ at the three, Devin Vassell as the other wing player, and then you've got Jakob Pertl there. And they've also got some other nice pieces that they got there on the bench that's just hidden there nicely. They are missing a bit of star power. You're hoping one of these players can develop that star potential. And these guys, these guys are still on their rookie contracts. They're all still on their rookie contracts. So it's very exciting for the Spurs. AJ, 29th pick overall, Lonnie Walker, 18th. What are you doing, other franchises? What are you doing? So that wraps up this division. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to move on to Central. <laughs> 